So the reason I show this is that it's sort of how, it's sort of amazing how effortlessly we read this, right? We cannot avoid reading this, right? And this, and this is something we can sort of capture within much less than a second. And maybe already when you see that, you maybe have like images like this coming to mind, like images of Holland. I actually saw one of these on the way to, I thought they were just like Disney parks, but they're not, they're actually just down there. But anyway, so, uh, so, so this, so, so this, of course, this is really fascinating about we sort of automatically do, do, do this, do this and read and also make these associations. So what is new, I mean, this, of course, is something that people have been wondering about for, for hundreds of years. So what is special now, really, is that we now have a way to look into the brain when, uh, when, we, when we perceive and when we think and when we associate. So, and this is, so even though my topic is modeling the brain, I really like to highlight this is what is really special about these times, I think, in terms of neuroscience. At least one of the things that is special is that we have now this, this new way to image brain activity at the systems level. Maybe we should turn off the light. Is it light okay? No, you cannot. No, okay, I won't do that. So then you can both measure like the, the brain structure, but also you can also measure brain activity, like non-invasively, so without putting needles into to, to peop, uh, people's heads. So you can either measure like the things like the MEG, EEG, uh, which will measure the electrical activity of the brain, positron emission tomography, PET, which measure, measures the food consumption, or fMRI, which we're going to learn more about uh, tomorrow, which measures the blood, blood dynamics. And just to, to, to um, to, to sort of like to, to highlight sort of the, the importance of this thing, of this brain, this brain imaging thing is, is I would like to refer to this book here. Every 50 years or so, there are like the leading physicists of the day, supposedly, I don't know really how they are recruited, but they meet in Princeton. I was not invited, but uh, so, uh, and, and then they come out with this, this book, where they identify what is the big questions of the, of the today. And this, the last one was in 96, and then this book came out afterwards. And it's sort of interesting to look at the, 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 the contents because it's, well, first down there, it's like five chapters about the really small stuff, like Higgs boson and like particle acceleration stuff. And there are three about the big stuff, like universes or the universe and, and, and these things. And then there are three about complexity. Actually, we have a neurobiologist mentioned there as part of complexity, which of course is, is cool. And then yeah, one thing on this entanglement, this weird quantum stuff. But what surprised me maybe was this, this sixth chapter, the ongoing revolution in Im medical imaging. So this was even by physicists deemed to be so important that it gave like a separate chapter in this, in this book. So with this kind of, uh, I mean, with imaging, this whole new sort of like a new set of tools that is now of course intensively used in like in, in in clinical neuroscience and like in basic neuroscience and psychologists use it, use it and so on. And so I'm just going to show an example of this kind of, the kind of study you can do. And this is our, our, our brain, or like a reconstruction of our brain. Of course our brain is, is wrinkled, but it's not, so you have this, now it's colored with the green part like facing out and then the, the red part's covered in like cracks. But logically, it's not a difference between the, the, the cortex, which is covered inside the, the cracks and, and the thing on the surface. So logically, you can just sort of expand it like this. So this is sort of from the logical point of view what the brain looked like. Does anyone know why, why we are like this and not like this? Has anyone given birth? <laughs> I heard, I, I just sort of, I just have a daughter and that wasn't, I mean, for, for me it was okay, but my. <laughs> But this was hard enough with this thing, so of course this thing would be really, really, really tough, right? But it's the, the key thing is really to have as much cortical area as possible within, like, within a skull so that you can give birth to it. So this is an example of a, a, a friend of mine, uh, Anders Dale, who did this measurement of, uh, it was a with MEG, it was measuring the magnetic field of, of people who were just like you, shown words. You were shown Holland. So this was, and then, so I'm going to start this movie now, and it's, it, you can see the brain here, and this is the back part of the brain. So when you turn on, when you show this word, the first place you have activity is actually in the back of the brain, because that's a camera part of the brain. And then you can actually quite, I mean, immediately after, you can see this activity spreading forward. So I'm going to run it in a loop, because it's running quite fast. 
but it counts up to 800 milliseconds and then it returns again. Okay, now it's going up to 800 and it starts again. And then, ping, and then you can actually see that it starts, starts there. But what we immediately, what we see really is, so what this color shows is really where on the brain is this, what part of the brain is active in processing this, this word. In this case, it was actually an unknown word. So this was a word that people uh, had not, see, had not seen, seen before, not like Holland. And it turns out that just after a few hundred milliseconds, you can see a difference in these signals depending on whether it's an unknown word or a known word. So this is now used to, to explore like the possible application in lie detectors. Because if you sort of, uh, uh, that if you sort of, have you seen this person before? Like this, this, this mafia boss, and then no. And then you can actually see in the brain whether this is a familiar, familiar face or, or not. So this is actually one ap application of this. Anyway, so this is a whole new, new forest of, of uh, I mean, you know, lots of activities along those lines. But of course we would like to go in and see where does these signals come from? And then we have to look, look into the brain, and we have all this, this uh, you sort of take a, a blow up, a piece of, of this brain. You can have, the, you have this gray layer at the, at the surface here, and you have this, and this is where all the neurons are, the little gray. In humans, it's like two, three, four millimeters thick. And, and then, because these, these images are taken by, by, this is actually a monkey, monkey brain, and then they add one kind of ink, which only fills this, uh, the cell centers of the neur these neurons. If you take another kind of ink, you actually fill all of the neurons, but only a very small fraction. If, if, if it filled everyone, it would be completely black. But what this shows is that this, each of these dots actually are, are just, uh, I mean, uh, are, uh, corresponds to this very branched, branch out structure. So here we are taking some of these, these, um, these neurons and, <coughs> and superimpose them on this slide just to show what it really looks like. So this is like one of these dots which has been replaced by this yellow green thing with the red, the yellow red thing. The red thing is the, the dendrites where the neurons get input from other cells. And the yellow thing is where it projects to, to other cells. So this is really what we are. We are like 100 billion neurons like this sending signals to each other. So it's just amazing that, that it works, right, just by by looking at it. But I think at least the, the, the key player here is the nerve cell, the neuron. That's like the fundamental, in some sense, the fundamental. Yeah, I mean, all life is cellular based, and I think that like the neuron, the, the neuron is like the fundamental thinking unit. Or maybe like you would say glia cells also, like this, like this. So like the, now there's like this revival of the glia cells. And the old talks start with the glia community, start with, oh, they've always said that glia cells were just like these boring janitors and not doing anything, but now it's sort of like, uh, anyway, so it's both neurons and glia, but glia don't fire action potentials, which are sort of the thing that communicates information. So, <coughs> so this is a, a neuron, and then <coughs> it has all these dedicated, uh, dedicated branches. And they have like one axon projecting signals to other neurons, and then they have all this input then writes. And actually, each of these neurons are like a machine with all kinds of like machinery, both uh, like also inside the cell, and they also have things on the outside, which make it work properly. And, and what is the key thing that makes a neuron a neuron? Well, the key thing is it has this electrically, it's sort of this electrically excitable cell, meaning that it has this permanent voltage difference between inside and outside of about one-tenth of a volt. It's like the same kind of volt we have in the, in the plug here. Here's 220, here it's like one-tenth. One and they are set up by these particular ion channels, which are proteins embedded in the membrane, <coughs> which, um, uh, which then, um, uh, then sort of makes these little tunnels. Like in this case, there's a tunnel, it makes this tunnel which only led through the green ions and not the purple ions. And the green ions are, in this case, the potassium ions. Uh, so uh, while the, the, the purple are, are the sodium ions. And that's, if you think of it, it's not that easy to make a tunnel that lets through, like, only through the green guys and not the purple guys. I mean, it's uh, because they're very, very similar, just atoms with one plus, right? But anyway, so these, these proteins know how to do it. But it's uh, like the combination of these proteins and ion channels that makes a neuron a neuron. 
So this, all these activities, activity at all the way from the nanometer level up to the, like, the meter level going on in the neural, neural system. So this, all this, this is sort of like this multi-scale multi -scale feature of the brain. But it's not only multi-scale in space, it's also multi-scale in time. Because you have molecular processes lodging large, large, uh, lasting like a nanosecond or so up to like the, the lifetime of the, of, of the organism. So there's all this, I would say now, there's all these initiatives now trying to, to, to make models of the brain combining, I mean, bridging all these, all these levels. You may have heard of some of them. One is this human brain project in EU, which was started last year, which involves uh, a lot of money and also a lot of researchers. But the idea is really to use these models or this kind of like a set of models uh, to, to integrate all this, this information and also make simulations for, for to, to make us help, help us learn about how the brain works. Then you also have the brain project in, in US, which maybe have a little bit different focus, but also is about bridging scales. And then also this is, I think, very interesting project at the Allen, Allen uh, Institute for Brain Science in Seattle, uh, where they now want to actually do this reverse engineering of the mouse, mouse cortex. So uh, what I hope to do, what I plan to do today is sort of talk a little bit about sort of how you can sort of, how one can approach of trying to bridge these, these, these levels. And the good thing, I think the good thing is that we, we have this, here we have these different levels all the way from, from molecules, the synapses and market circuits all the way up to systems. And we sort of know, we know the basic laws of physics. The, the laws of physics was, essentially, at, at least within the brain, I think, was essentially de determined in the 20th century. So that's sort of like, I think that's going to be like the, the legacy of the 20th century in terms of science. Well, there's many legacies, gene is one thing. But in terms of like, one of the legacies will be that this is the, the century where we, we figured out um, like the basic laws of nature. We figure out how the atoms and ions and everything moves in the solar system, I think, and, and also in the brain. So we know how to describe we know how to describe the, the basic building blocks of the brain. And essentially at the molecular level, it's used essentially this, one of these Newton laws, F equals MA, but you also need some help from quantum, quantum mechanics. But this is this molecular, uh, molecular dynamics field, which is sort of like a very active field, which does this kind of, of computation. I think the last year's Nobel Prize in chemistry was given to the people who developed major contributions to that. And then, because up at the higher level, you are at this, when you have like this, all these molecules making new molecules and, and reacting and so on, then you have these rate equations. And then we have these special equations up at the, at, at the neuron level, which is a combination of something called the cable equation and maybe the diffusion equation. One equation for the membrane potential across the, across the cell membrane and one for the diffusion of, of, of ions, the key, like, like calcium, for example, was like the me, a, key, a key signaling molecule. And I think that, I would say like one ultimate goal, I think would be to, if we can make a model constructed at least from the neuron and upwards, which then could predict this, what comes out of these new brain imaging techniques. So, this is just like a mock-up simulation or sort of more like illustration of a dream, I guess, uh, made by Ingo Boyack, where he actually took this neural network uh, model, like we essentially put it on, on, on nodes corresponding to like structural nodes of the brain, and then they put in some kind of dynamics. But what, what this shows is sort of the, the kind of predictions that you can get. This is like all model generated. So this is the same model that both predicts like the EEG, that you would measure, the electrical potential we measure at the surface of the brain. And also if you do something called the voltage sensitive dye imaging where you can measure the average membrane potentials in the neurons at the top of the brain, then it would look something like this. And this slow thing here is, is what you would measure with the functional, functional MRI. So I think this is sort of like one, uh, sort of like this one of the, so one of the holy grails of, of this one modeling the brain is sort of how to go from this microscopic scale up to this macroscopic scale, which you can then 
measure not only so um, because this is something you can do with humans. I mean, this this doesn't this is like non-invasive. <laughs> so we want to go all the way from molecules to uh, to up to this and uh, the CNS or the the whole system. <coughs> but I will focus on on like starting with neurons, which I think is like the the the, the, the most central part, the key the key element. And so we have this. Mental activity is due to, as I mentioned, 100 billion nerve cells, maybe a factor of 1,000 or 10,000 more connections. And interestingly, we, I showed you the piece of the, of the human cortex. And if you took a little section of my human cortex and, and looked, just looked at it and compared it with a little section from the rat cortex, it wouldn't look much different. So the key thing that we have is that we have much more cortex. That's what it seems at least. So, that is also good from a research point of view. We can actually learn a lot about our cortex from looking at the mouse cortex or, or the rat, rat cortex. So, and <laughs> what do these neurons do? Well, I think that if you put in a sharp electrode in the center of a neuron, you can measure this potential difference about one tenth of a millio, uh, one tenth of a volt, and then occasionally. Like it's, it's a little bit, a little bit of a noisy behavior, and then occasionally you get these sharp pulses, which last about one millisecond, one thousandth of a second, and they are these action potentials, and they are the only ones which are projected to other cells. So that is sort of what the, the, the how the brain communicates. They send these action potentials to each other, and they essentially all look the same. So it's not information in the shape of the action potential, just in the timing. So <coughs> all information is essentially is in the coded in the arrival times of these action potentials. So uh, I used to do semiconductor physics in, in, the, in, the, in the old days before I came to my senses and I switched to neuroscience, which is much more, much more fun. Now, I, for me, it was a little bit accidental. But anyway, what, uh, what I didn't know was that neuroscience, because you think the brain is so complicated, you, you can, how can you model this thing? And, but the, the key thing is that, then, well, neuroscience is actually, well, I think, maybe the, the, uh, the, the, um, the subfield of, top, uh, of biology where these computational methods have been most used, uh, uh, at least among them. And, and I think the reason is that there is, we, we have a good mathematical description for how one single neuron processes information. So we have a good, precise description of, of that. And, and, and after all, neurons are our information processing units. So, and that has been essentially available for, well, almost 50 years. Almost 50 years, and that has given us a very good starting point for, for using this, this, like this, this, using the program which they have been, um, uh, which they had, like, had in physics with this combination of experiments and modeling which has been running for at least 100 years. And uh, so that's what I'm going to go through. The, the, I think the key, the key thing is really to, that you have an, to, to tell you a little bit about how do you model the signal processing in neurons. And the first thing to know about the neuron is that it, it has this, of course, all cells are enclosed by membranes. But these membranes, from an electrical point of view, are very insulating. So they don't, it, they can actually sustain enormously, enormous amount or a very, very high electric fields without short circuiting. The, and the good thing about that is then if you put in a little tunnel in it, like with an ion channel, then you can sort of, you can regulate it very well, the, the current, because it's insulating to begin with. So that was sort of what evolution found out, that you could put in these different ion channels, which uh, do all kinds of things. You can sort of selectively let through sodium. Or, or potassium, or also chloride channels, and they have other channels. And they have all the other, other channels or who, who do, does other things, like these ion pumps, for example, setting up the right, the right uh, concentration differences between the inside and outside of the, of the neuron membrane in order to get this like, membrane potential of about one tenth, tenth of a volt. And we know how to model this. And because we can model this uh, as sort of a like current going through a biological membrane can be modeled as sort of like, like currents going through the tunnel with like normal ohmic resistance. 
and it has this additional, and then it has this additional capacitive current, due to the fact that this biological membrane has these capacitive properties. So it looked very much like the electrical circuit that maybe some of you had in, like, uh, in, in when was, if you studied physics. Uh, so, but the big difference is that in the, in the electronics, it's electrons that uh, that moves, but in the brain, it's ions. And the ions are much bigger. I mean, electrons are small pieces of atoms, very very light. Ions are just essentially just atoms who have who are charged. So they are very sluggish and and. Uh, I mean, much harder to move, and that's why the, the time scales, the time scales in, in, in neuroscience or in like in, the, in uh, like for signal processing in the neuron is much much slower than in the than in electronics. But anyway, we know how to model it. For example, if we then have assume this cellular cell where you inject an electric current, this could sort of mimic sort of like a current that you get from a synaptic input. <coughs> then we can, essentially the, the relationship between the, the voltage and the injected current follows this very simple equation, which is essentially Kirchhoff's current law, saying that current or charge cannot vanish. So it's essentially like a current conservation <coughs> law. And from that, we can actually predict, for example, if you have a, a cell which is then where you, we have this uh, uh, where the current is turned on at time t equals zero, and then turn off at t equals capital T. Then you can actually compute and get these exact expressions for the how the membrane potentials get sort of what's like essentially like it's called depolarized and, and how it releases back to the resting potential, and so on. So the first simulators that people used in computational neuroscience were just taken from these people who make, investigate uh, electrical circuits, like the people who design these electronic circuits, like P-spice and so on. <clears throat> but this is a rather boring neuron, because if you had then like input currents from other neurons shown, uh, shown here, well, if you get like a synaptic input current, like an extra current from another neuron, you get sort of like deep depolarization and then it goes back and not much happening. But luckily there's, the, the neuron does more because it turns out that if you get enough of these currents in at the same time so that this membrane potential gets depolarized, it goes from like minus 60 millivolts to maybe to like in this case minus 40 millivolts, then the, the so-called action potential is spontaneously generated. Uh, and then you, you sort of you start living, essentially the membrane starts living on a life on its own and fires this, gets this very actually uh, yeah, polarized state and then before it comes back and that's what this, this spike is. So, <clears throat> and I think the starting point in many sense of computational neuroscience was that was when we, or not when we, we as the field, when the field found out how to model such action potentials. And that's this work that maybe some of you have heard about. How many of you have heard about Hodgkin Huxley? So uh, yeah, that's good. So that's uh, so I can uh, just, well anything. I'll I'll go through it anyway. But uh, so what they did was, or they they focused on. Well, they found this essentially this mathematical model that describes how action potential propagates down the axon of a particular particular animal. And this animal was a particular squid. Uh, and what was special about this squid was that it had a very thick axon. So instead of like one micrometer thick, one thousand of a millimeter, it was like one millimeter thick. So that meant that you could sort of do all kinds of manipulations with it and, and change the solution inside and of course outside. And, and so all kinds of things in order to identify, identify the system. So based on, and, and that was really the key, key thing that they had all these ways to manipulate the system. And I think that's it's something to learn about that when you, if you want to, because it turned out that even though this, this, that they found this model for this one millimeter thick axon, the same thing could be used for like ordinary axons, one micrometer thick axons. So it's essentially the same formalism, the same insight that we got, or the insight we got from this system could be generalized to other neurons. Uh, 
Uh, so it's all about finding the right model system, and I think it's the same when you look back at quantum mechanics. Actually, the, everybody worked on the simplest atom, the hydrogen atom, and that was done in 1926, and that was really, really, really hard to find that Schrodinger equation. But when that was done, it was like they had like helium and the other atoms in the periodic systems within like, a, at least in principle, within a couple of years. So I think that's, it's something to learn about finding the system which is sort of most vulnerable or most least complicated to understand. Okay, in order to, to understand their experiments, they had to assume these different uh, conductances that in addition to, the, um, uh, to these passive conductances, they also had these active pot potassium and sodium conductances. <coughs> so these are sort of like very, well, finely tuned filters, which only lets one of these types of ions through. So they set up this, essentially for the model they set up, in addition to the capacitive current and the passive current, had, uh, had this uh, so sodium and potassium currents. And they had formally the same shape as these ohmic currents. It has like this sort of conductance, which is one over the resistance, multiplied by the, by essentially the voltage, uh, voltage drive. But there's a lot of things hidden in this. These are not numbers anymore. These are actually a function of voltage and, and time. And in order to, to, uh, to, to study that, or they model these, these. <laughs> so that was. So anyway, so they, they, they thought of this, the, the gates of this, uh, the, the gating of, or these conductances as governed by these different gating variables, m, h, and n, which could sort of as sort of like, um, well, essentially, um, uh, well, in guards to sort of uh, essentially, well, control the, the, the current flow to going through these, uh, these ion channels. Yes? I would like to make a comment on the, um, on the difference between ions and electrons in this, because this is, I mean, the, you mentioned that the ions are much slower than electrons, and that's why everything is a little bit sluggish. But on the other hand, that actually has been a very smart move of nature to use ions, because there's only one type of electrons, but there are many kinds of ions. And that allows biology to use colored currents, in a way. Mm. So you have colored wires, yeah. which uh, otherwise are very difficult to make. We have to use insulation to do this. Yeah. But uh, by using ions, you get all this for free. That's true. No, no, that's true. Yeah, so what did you say? Colored. Yeah, because they have two types of currents. Are colored, because you see they have all these suffixes, mm. potassium, sodium, calcium. Yeah. Whereas if you just have electrons, there would just be electrons. There are no sodium electrons. There are no calcium electrons. So, but functionally, that, uh, so the role that plays, you argue, is... In an electrical circuit, that would correspond to different wires which you have to insulate against each other. Ah, okay. Yeah. Wow. But, so it's true. but here, you get this for free. So you have like two slow guys compared to one really, really fast one. <laughs> so anyway, but it's true. So, but it's true that, yeah. It also has to do with the time scale of the processes because having a much faster method of processing would be harmful. I think they're having that problem with the spinnaker, the simulation using the... Yeah, I mean, that's sort of like, that. this is like what's called alternative history writing or whatever it is. Like this is. <laughs> Just if anyone's interested, if you're ever in Plymouth, England, you can visit the Hodgkin Huxley lab, it's now a museum. And you can see on the ceiling, covered by plexiglass or perspex, depending which side of the Atlantic yeah. you're on, where all their failed experiments are. Because they, if they um, made a giant axon prep that didn't work, forgotten which one, I think Hodgkin would just throw it up and it would stick on the oh, ceiling. Really? So all these things are stuck on the ceiling there still. Oh, really? Fantastic. <laughs> so. It's worth going to see. The, the instruments are really crude. <laughs> okay. Okay, anyway, this, back to these gating particles. They were then all essentially uh, described by this, uh, this like, first order dynamics. Uh, we have all these voltage-dependent coefficients. And, but at the end of the day, 
they had to fit this this coefficients here alpha this this, this the, the, well determining the dynamics of these gating variables and that was just fitted to experiments and that ties a little bit back to Jonathan's I mean because he talked about descriptive models models how to describe essentially data and at that time this they at that time they didn't even know what an ion channel was or whether they existed so they had no no choice but to have this descriptive or this statistical model of the, how these things depended on 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 voltage and of course that was also the key that really also established this thing of an, of an ion channel as a way to think about think about the neurons so um, anyway so the, the, the they used one set of experiments to fit all the parameters in the models, and then they sort of tested it on a separate experiment, essentially just letting this action potential move, uh, and, and then tested that in the experiment, it moved around, well, like 21.2 20, meters per second, and in theory it was 18.8. So this is among the, I like the, the, the best I say, quantitative agreements in, in well, certainly in neuroscience, and also in, in computational biology of all time. So I think this really was like the, this was some sense the starting point of computational neuroscience, even though it took a long time before I, it sort of became a f like at least many people working in the field. But I go a little bit back on this, as I mentioned this, now we know that these ion channels are uh, not, I mean, they, they are really just these ion, they, well, they're really proteins, uh, embedded in the membrane, because this is like a new, new insight. But it also shows this, this idea of a, that the model hierarchy. We don't want to have a model for the brain where you just put in all ions and atoms and lipids, what have you, into this big simulator and just sort of do like Newtonian me mechanics on, on, on everything. It wouldn't work, for one thing, but also it, it would be very difficult to understand what, understand the model. It wouldn't sort of give, give a, much insight. So I think there's sort of this, that you need these models to sort of, uh, well, what, what models really, I think at least if you look at this, where the successes have been so far, it's really been as acting as sort of bridges between different levels of understanding. That you have sort of, you, you, you develop these sort of different concepts at different levels, like molecules, ion channels, neurons, and so on, and then, um, and then these models ties these different concepts together. So I think this is well illustrated by, for example, this key concept of the Hodgkin-Huxley model, the ion channel, where, these, where you, this is sort of a mechanistic model because it's based on this circuit description of the neuron. And then when you go, go look, look into the elements of, the, of these, these currents, you end up with this with like descriptive model of the of the, the the voltage dynamics so i think this is an example of a multi-scale what's it like model hierarchy where for example if you have like a mechanistic model for proteins and cell membranes this is not what hodgkin huxley had but in principle then from that you should be able to derive this statistical model for the ion channel kinetics that actually hodgkin and huxley fitted to their experiments and that can be used then as input into a mechanistic model for action potentials in neurons, like Hodgkin and Huxley did. And then again, because then we get the statistical model for action potentials in neurons. That's essentially what, uh, essentially just a firing rate or whatever, spiking, spike trains. And that is essentially what, what Jonathan talked about, which then can be used into like models for, um, I mean, uh, network models. <coughs> okay, so, so now, based on essentially this, since the work of Hodgkin and Huxley, uh, the, the, their approach has been generalized to, to essentially cover all parts of signal processing in the neuron, not just the, not just the axon. So we now have, we're in this very fortunate situation to have these mathematical descriptions available for all processes dealing with signal processing in the, in the brain. And one thing is, I mean, you have like these dendrites that you get signals in, and you have this, if you have enough current coming into the soma during a time window, then this signal propagates down the axon, and then it gets out to the nerve terminal, connecting to other cells, and then you have this diffusion across the synapse and so on. So then it's a different process, 
like diffusion is not electrical, but nevertheless it's well understood, I would say, like mathematically. And the scheme we use then is this what's called compartmental forward modeling scheme. You take this, take a neuron, divide it up into small compartments. Each compartment is so small that, that the membrane potential can be assumed constant within the compartment. And then for each of these compartments, for example, compartment I, you keep track of all the currents going into or leaving this compartment. And you essentially say that this, they can't, they can't vanish, you're just like a, they're keeping track of all the currents and saying that it has to, to sum to zero. And this is the Kirchhoff's uh, current law. So then, if one specifies all parameters for all current segments, and for all current terms in all segments, the mathematical solution is in principle straightforward. So there are like these ta free mathematical simulators which are, are available. Uh, sure. Can you go uh, two slides? Uh, two slides back, yeah. So the, the, the body, does the body have any structure? Not in this. Not in this, Well, uh, well okay. I mean, that's uh, typically the- Does it ever? If it has, typically, uh, the question of whether it has to be, so the question is really, do, the, can it be a single compartment? Yeah. And, and the question there is not really so much related to shape as it is to whether it's electrically compact, meaning that the potential differences within the SOMA is very, very small. And typically it's very small because the soma is quite big. Right. Okay, but do, does anybody uh, worry about that or does anybody who model who model the who does these multi-compartmental models worry about the structure within the body within the, the soma? Within the soma? Well, I mean it's also been tested. I mean, you can so just if if you want in your multi-compartmental models you can just divide the soma up into whatever. So I guess in things like the state of the art now, in terms of modeling, I mean like the blue brain or things like that, do people worry about that there or? Yeah, I mean this is, I don't think this is, uh, there's, there are other issues I'm coming to which is, is more worrisome, but at least this is something you can systematically explore. How small, how, how many compartments do you need to make or divide the neurons up into in order to not have this problem. So this is something we can we control. It's a comment or question. I, I can comment on this. So the, you always have to ask yourself, what is the precision of the description of any element that you actually get uh, before you reach the typical measurement variability? Yeah? And, and so for many cases, this type of modeling is good enough and you don't really have to worry about the exact shape of the dendrite as long as you have this equivalence tree correct. <coughs> Things change, of course, if you put multiple neurons next to each other, then because then the, the shape determines which neuron can connect to which other neuron. Yeah, because there are many ways in which you could bend and uh, elongate uh, any of the branches. And another thing that we, that Gaute maybe mentions, but we also have to keep in mind that the Hodgkin-Huxley model as such, and also the cable equations are also um, gross simplifications. So the Hodgkin-Huxley model by itself is just a phenomenological model. It doesn't explain why the ion channels actually do what they are doing. And then if you want to really go a level lower, then you are, you're reaching an entire different set of tools where you actually model the lipid layers as they are. And then you also will learn that the ion channels are actually not sitting at a fixed lo location, but they're kind of diffusing around and that nothing is stable anymore and things become amazingly dynamic. That, that's relevant to the dynamics of the, the neuron? It depends at which precision you look at the dynamics of the neuron. For certain processes, this... For example, if you, if you want to understand what's happening in the vicinity of the synapse during information transmission and also during plasticity, these things become highly relevant because suddenly then the activity determines which type of new ion channels get expressed and, and then go into the membrane and, and everything. But I, but I have one thing I would like to mention there, and uh, also you have a talk afterwards. <laughs> no, but, but I know that's fine. But, that, but the point is that we don't really know what goes what, what, we know how to model things. We just don't really know what all the elements are going. We don't know where all ion channels are. But we, we, so it's like a different, I used to do semiconductor physics and the modeling there. And there we knew all the parameters to like four or five digits. And, 
<clears throat> and, and that was not, but then it was still hard calculations, but when we knew what went into the model here, we don't really, don't really do that. Uh, can you elaborate about non-specific ion channels? So, for example, any cells, excitative cells, maybe brain cell or any other smooth muscle or heart cell. So we have no idea about that non-specific uh, ions. So how to model those non-specific channels? Yeah, I think I'm, this is sort of like, there's a whole slew of, of channels. There's some of these non-specific cat, cation channels which both, I think, both has uh, like then sodium and, and potassium. So, um, um, but so, but this, at, I mean, it's, uh, so it, in principle, this can be, can be, uh, be modeled in the same, modeled in the same way, but it, the, you need like separate experiments actually to find good models for each of these, these, uh, these ion channels. So, Galta, I had one last or one other question which is, do you do anything special about the axon hillock and the generator? Sure, I mean, this is... Uh, because sure, presumably where the spike is initiated hmm. is important to what happens. Absolutely, so there are, I mean, but I mean, you have neural models where, where actually, some of the neural models have the spike starting in axon hillock. Oh. Yeah. So it's nothing, it's just ion channels where you put the high density yeah. of ion channels. I see. So, so it's sort of, so it's sort of like the, the biophysical modeling scheme, it, it's more about where you put ion channels, which is like, you know, of course, an open-ended thing. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing, I think, is that we know, we can, we can try out all kinds of things. We know how to model it, which is, oh, what are the consequences of having this sort of high density in the hexon hillock instead of the soma, or dividing the soma into two, and whatever. I mean, you can do all kinds of things. So it's like an open-ended program. That's why it's, I think it's really, you have a solid starting point. You can get off the ground, as Jonathan would, I guess, would, <laughs> would say it. So, this is just an illustration of the kind of, of modeling uh, you can do. This is just five neurons or something that is put around like an electrode. <coughs> I think that's sort of the four things. And just showing that this, this, this was a simulation we did to, to test sort of essentially the, this um, measurement methods. How are the spikes that you pick up an electrode related to, to firing activity? But the point is that this is just pure, we have like, we're like masters of our little model universe and can try out different things and, and investigate. So we, so we have a solid starting point, I would say, for, for these kind of model explorations and also moving on into to networks. I also like to, I don't know, this is, uh, the cable equation was, was derived 150 years ago. Because then I think, I think now we would say that the coolest project of the day is figuring out how the brain works. And I think from the, at least from the European point of view, maybe the coolest project 150 years ago was to get a cable across the Atlantic so that we could send signals in Morse and not have these boats going for weeks, right? And then, of course, the problem, how do you, one thing, many issues, how do you get a long cable away and how do you put it into the sea? And so this is like this boat that I like to put out the, 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 the cable thing. But also, how, how do you make the cable so that the signal actually makes it across the Atlantic? So that's when you had to do make the cable equation. So we, it's sort of like interesting that the same equation that was used to describe this cable was, is now uh, is used to describe, describe neurons, because which is at the heart of, of like this multi-compartmental modeling. Just I want to show an example of, uh, uh, this is like a project we did. We tried to build this multi-compartmental model for a particular interneuron in the early visual system, it's an LGN or, th or thalamus. So it had all these very branchy structures and it's, it's a complicated behavior. And, and then we had this, this is like a very standard kind of computational neuroscience project. We had some experiments, there were like collaborators putting a sharp electrode into the center, the soma, injecting current and getting out these spikes. There's like two interneurons. And then uh, we looked Essentially, it looked at the, the, the kind of the set of, uh, I think it was like 10 or 11 conductances or something, which are known to be present in these neurons. And then we fitted the models. And so we got models uh, which could explain that particular kind of data. And then we declared victory and published, essentially. And, uh, and this is sort of like the typical thing to do. But this sort of... Uh, I was thinking, everybody can see the elephant in the room there. 
So where's the, I think there's a big elephant in the room in computational neuroscience, which has to do with this, how we deal with these parameters. Because it's, it's really clear that, that um, I mean, we, we find these models which are able to account for the data, and then we in some sense think of it that, that these are sort of unique parameters which are typical for these neurons. But really, it isn't. I mean, it's, you can actually see that these neurons, they, these ion channels are continuously sort of updated and, and changed and, and transcribed. So I think this is one of the big, I think one of the questions that some of you asked before this course was sort of what are the big things, big challenges in, in uh, computational neuroscience, where can it be in like five years or something, something that can be improved in like a reasonably short uh, time frame. And I think this is a key thing because I think there, there's some recent, actually some papers from this year, from Eve Mardish group, if some of you know her, where they've seen how you can actually, some of these conductances, which everybody else is just fitting, actually could stem from, uh, from like homostasis or plasticity rules. Um, that, that essentially, these are regulated by the calcium concentrations in, in the DNA or, or in the nucleus, which essentially regulates this transcription of the different ion channels. So I think we're going, going to move away from this parameter fitting to go ahead, get more into this plasticity rules that the parameters are set by or plasticity or homostasis rules. And I think that's, that's a very exciting um, topic of study. Okay, so um, now, okay, it's, maybe we should take a, like a little break now because it's been an hour or like 50 minutes. Maybe if you have some questions at this stage. Yeah, there's some. I have a question or like if you have any comments on burst firing or like firing patterns in, in, in neurons from models or this model? Sure, so, uh, so some of these neurons turn out to be, uh, I mean, are such that they, when they fire a spike, it does, they don't only fire a single spike, but they actually get a, like, send like a burst of, uh, of spikes. And uh, it's, these are, there are also lots of neuron models which actually accounts for this bursting. And it also turns out that whether you burst or not depends on like, essentially like your immediate history, if whether you sort of like receive more inhibition and excitation in the, in, the, in, the, in the past. So this is quite, there's certain conductances, combinational conductances which gives this bur bursting activity instead of like individual spikes. In these models, when you then uh, fit your model to the data, how do you validate uh, the, the results? Yeah, I think these are sort of uh, what we, yeah, what, what we, I mean, what we typically do is that we sort of, we look for, we look for, uh, for parameters or uh, that actually some can, can sort of get, I mean, you, you have like this, there's like, there's different ways to do it. I mean, it's like this least square fitting that you essentially just look at the, what is the, how do you, I mean, the, 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 you need a cost function or an error function. And it could either be uh, that it, you look at the difference between the voltage in your model and your experiment, or uh, it could also could be that you look more for features, meaning that when you, the distance between different spikes should be a certain, so, so there's like different kind of cost functions. But you, you always validate, uh, you, you, you check it for the data that you just used to deduce the parameters. You don't then cross-check it with yeah, the well, new... That's also, that, that's also done, right? So you have like these different kinds of... Uh, mm. There was one question in the back there. Yeah. Um, what do you think, what is the role of the neuron in case of keeping the data? Not only the transmitting data and the keeping the data. What do you think, what is the role of... So how, how, that's more like the question of memory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, 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 the idea is that, the, I would say like the traditional <coughs> idea of memory is that they are, has to do with the synaptic connection strengths. Meaning that if you have synaptic connection between two neurons, uh, then, um, then I mean, the, the, like uh, if you get an incoming spike, that will give a certain response at the, at the receiving neuron. And this weight, this, the, the determining its connection can be essentially updated uh, and or it can be can be changed according to so that's this spike timing spike timing dependent plasticity 
for example. So, so there are like essentially synapses is like one one key thing. There's also all the ways to, to remember, right? Right? It's, I mean, you can you can you can make changes in the neuron at longer time scales that you essentially make another set of ion channels, so to change the ion channel distribution. There's also now some some recent recent work which points to or suggests that actually these extracellular matrix molecules that uh, that they can actually sort of play a role in sort of like really long term memories that in some sense encapsulating the synapses something called perineural nets which I just learned about this year actually so for me it's actually quite uh, quite new but it's uh, so there are several candidates. So in this uh, point, the soma has a important role, I think, to keep connection history, let's say. Yeah, but these synapses are, are all over the place, not only at the... So the synapses are all over the neuron. So I said, like, the, the soma is more like the, like the, the CPU in a sense that it, that's where if you had, get enough currents in, <coughs> electrical current in from all the branches, in within a certain time window, then you generate an action potential. So I think that's that's at least one. <coughs> that's obviously I think that the soma does. So it's not clear that the soma has a particular role, mm -hmm. at least not in the synaptic part of it. Uh, the threshold for a particular ion channel, it is always constant, or it changes. You know. Well, can you repeat the question? For a particular ion channel. Yeah. The threshold to trigger the spike, for example, sodium or calcium like this, is it constant or it varies according to some... Yeah, I don't know. This is, I think, typically <coughs> it's assumed to, to be constant. Uh, but I think there are also like some of these, there's things happening inside the cell, like that this phosphorylation things, that you can sort of attach things from the, from the inside that can actually change, change things also. I'm not quite sure if it's... Uh, if it's I don't have a full overview of it, but I think typically in these models you <coughs> you, you think of them as, as constant. And so if you consider the all or none principle, the spike peak is always constant or it also varies? Well, that, that is typically it's, I mean, uh, the, the peak, the spike itself may vary a little bit depending on how far, how long ago the previous spike fired. So in bursts, for example, the, the second spike is it's often smaller than the first spike and so on. But, but typically, if it's been a long time, then it's, it's the same. A long time since the previous spike, then it's the same. Um, I have a question about um, back propagation into the dendrites. Mm -hmm. I've heard that when an action potential is fired or, or not fired, you have um, uh, a back propagation of the voltage differences back into the dendrites. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, is that something that comes out of your uh, models, or is it uh, stopped uh, so that you don't get this, or...? No, no, so this, we have, that we have also models of this kind. There's this one model which came out from, um, it was actually from this Blue Brain uh, group. It's like the first author is Hay. It's Plus Computation Biology 2011, which we use a lot because it has all these this elements of backpropagating spikes and, uh, and like many of the, the fancy things. So you have models of this type, which also include this, this new, like the more fancy processing up in the apical dendrites of layer five cells and this NNDA spikes and all this, uh, all, all kinds of things. So it's not like a, yeah, it's like an open-ended thing. It's not a phenomenon which has been, I would say, on the neural, neuronal level, which is not sort of not capturable by a version of this type of model. Uh, all these models are uh, generic models or region-specific models because we have neurons from various regions of brains, yeah. because uh, if we deal with any cognitive disease, uh -huh. uh, what will be the response of uh, the neurons or the communication? Uh, is there any variation between uh, the communication from region to region? So there's, yeah, there's, there's also lots of variation within the same mm. cortical area. So I mean, for one thing, you have different neurons, uh, like even within like, you have different, well, you have neurons with different parameters, but which maybe has the same function. And then you have, like for example, this is like this bursting neurons, typically like what's called layer 5B. But if you go up to like just like in the top of layer 5, layer 5A, another just like a little bit higher up in cortex, you get very different types of, of, um, of neurons. And uh, when it comes to pathologies, it's, it's, really, it's really not, uh, not, not clear, even though I must, uh, maybe I should mention that now. Uh, 
is that this, there was also this question about GWAS studies. GWAS studies are this, you know, the, the, the human genome was discovered or sort of mapped out 10 years ago. So people have been trying to, to, uh, to link, of course, the, the, the genes. Statistically, I mean, looking at groups of like, for example, I, I'm collaborating with people who get schizophrenia. So now there was this paper that just came out in Nature, which had uh, like consortiums from, uh, I mean, involving hundreds of researchers all over the world, had been able to collect uh, like DNA samples and, and like gene analysis <coughs> from 40,000 people with schizophrenia and then 40,000 controls. So then they had enough data to, to statistically find out what are different statistically between the genes of a schizophrenic person compared to control. And many of these, when you look at, I and mean, they found about 100, 100 genes in that, in that study, and many of them coded for things, or codes for proteins, which are used, for example, for calcium channels and so on. So it could be that, like, that is that certainly, I mean, there are, there are hits. They're probably like, the, like some sense, disease genes, genes related to disease, which operates on the neuronal, neuronal level. Because the interest is, uh, if we, uh, uh, of course, all these models, electrical models, just matter of resistors and capacitors and charging and discharging. If we could model <coughs> region-specific models mm -hmm. and that could incorporate the pathology and uh, the communication of communication between different neurons and other things, then it will be easy for us to develop new systems that can take care of different diseases. Mm -hmm. And because uh, most of the uh, memory-related brain diseases are unique, I mean, uh, common. The symptoms remain com common, mm -hmm. and it's difficult to differentiate the different neurodegenerative diseases. Mm -hmm. So is there any scope for building region-specific uh, models um, comprising of the neurons and its responses? Sure, I mean, this is sort of like, in principle, one knows how to sort of reconstruct neurons and how to, I mean, it's, it's certainly the, the technology is already there for, for, doing, for doing this, I would say. Okay, I, I think I'll move on now to, to <coughs> simplify neural models, because now I talked about this multi-compartmental models, which are sort of like biophysically detailed. But there is also different variations, the other types of neural models which are simpler, because it turns out that, it, again, it has the question of what kind of, what kind of questions you're asking. Mm -hmm. And also, in sometimes, um, it, it, sometimes it, it, you can actually get away with essentially re reducing the dendrite to a point. That doesn't mean that the neuron itself is a point. It just means that the, the the, 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 the dendrites are so thick that the potential is the same all over the neuron, so that you can, uh, yeah, so that you can sort of uh, get away with that approximation. So <coughs> there is this whole other class of neurons which has been, or other type of neurons or class of neurons, these integrate and fire models, which typically has been modeled as like this single compartment, these point neurons, which has been investigated a lot because they are much, uh, they are simpler so that they can, you can do larger networks, simulations with them, but also that you can understand them from a more, <coughs> from a more, I mean, you can analyze them with more traditional tools and learn more about them. So it's a, it's a very simple kind of, uh, kind of model that essentially just gets all kind of synaptic inputs, has this very quite sort of simple, uh, like uh, passive model dynamics, but then when it, when it reaches a threshold, it fires a spike and, and, and is then reset. So that's one type of, and then you just count or measure sort of the, or just read out, read out the spikes. There's also variation of this model, which has, instead of like in, uh, in the integrated fire models are typically, there's the one ordinary differential equation, but there's also variations of this where you have two, where you can get all kinds of spiking and bursting and all kinds of different, different spiking dynamics. And then um, we have the, uh, the firing rate models, which are like even more coarse grained level, where instead of modeling individual action potentials, we model uh, the probability for firing action potentials. So you have these multi-level descriptions of, of neurons where you, uh, where you can then either have like this biophysically detailed model, simplified spiking neurons of this integrated fire type, or 
firing rate models. And one, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, so again, going back two slides, maybe uh, one more. So in, in the case of let's say Zikovich's model, if you so that is for for a single neuron at the at the axon eye lock. Mm -hmm. uh, so then, if you wanna if you wanna model the <coughs> the transmission of the signal, how do you get the, uh, how do you get that one? Because then you don't have an integrated model; you just have that one that at the axon eye lock. Yeah. You so, just yeah. So this is like then you have one. So you see that this generates. Uh, Trend rate spike, so it is like it's an integrated fire type model. Mm -hmm. So these spikes are then sort of collected and sent to other maybe like neurons in the network. But directly to another neuron yeah. with no well, modulation over the dendrites. Well, typically you put in you can put in some time delay. Okay. Yeah, so, but that's but that is sort of the key thing about. But that's it. it. Yeah, that's it, because it turns out that uh, at least that's sort of like the standard way to uh, that the action put that the, the. So you the, trust that it'll be uh, transmitted. Yeah. Faithfully over the uh, yeah. dendrites. Okay. Yeah. Over the axon. Over the axon, yeah. yeah. Across and the axon with a time delay. So you and have the model. In this model, you consider that each incoming spike has the same weight? Yeah, well, I mean, that, this, that is sort of a little bit independent. No, it's not in the same. This is just about the neuron dynamics. So it's not about sort of the, the synapses driving it. So you can have this is just how about the neuron processes the inputs. Maybe maybe to help Gauti here. So I will I will cover a little bit of this in the in the following talk. So you can you can actually see how you would produce these types of figures and uh, how to. Be patient. Yeah. Okay. So, but one thing which we need to do. I don't know. Uh, some of you have studied physics, and then you know that a gas of molecules can be described at two levels of detail, at least two levels of detail. You can either describe it at the level of molecules, and they move around in certain velocities, and so if, if, and, and they are at certain positions. So if you had like, uh, if you had like the list over like uh, all the velocities and positions of all these billions and billions of billions of gas molecules, you could actually in some sense understand the gas. But that's not how you typically describe a gas. Typically describe it in terms of thermodynamics, in terms of like things like pressure and voltage, and not voltage, pressure and volume, and, and temperature, and so on. So these were Boltzmann showed how these different of levels that actually it's not a contradiction here. You can start, start with this and use the tools of statistical physics, and, and then you end up with this thermodynamics. And this is, of course, at the end of the day, what we would like also to have for these different neural models, that you cannot just I mean, at least in principle, you cannot just have any kind of model at the causal level of detail. They must be, they must be related. So how well does that work right now? Well, uh, I, there's a lot of work going, uh, trying to link these levels, level two and level three, uh, and we, um, that, yeah. So that's, so that's, but it's st still work to be done. The first two are also connected. Hmm. Yeah, but well, but that, that's sort of harder because. But also a problem here that is very few sort of like off-the-shelf multi-compartmental models you can take, and which are sort of like to be where it makes which are sort of like general-purpose models. So it's a little bit unclear what is sort of the ground truth to start with. So I think there are, um, for the for the multi-compartmental models there are two things to to separate. The one is you have the dendritic tree. Mm -hmm which is cable equation. And it's typically passive. And for that, you can actually show that it is mathematically equivalent to a certain type of single compartment model, because it's purely passive. It's a linear system. The second aspect is a spike generation, which is governed by the Hodgkin-Huxley equations in the one case and by a simple threshold in the other case. Now, what you can do is, as a very old paper by Wolfram Gerstner, you can do a Volterra series expansion similar to what we've seen um, earlier today, and there you can actually see that the first kernel would r represent the integrate and fire um, representation, and the higher terms, which of course depend on the specific morphology and equations that you use in your level one model, but these kernels would then capture all the differences and all the extensions apart from the... But I think the limitation there is that, that I mean, these dendrites are not really <coughs> passive, so, in, so if you now they get more and more, 
I would say models, we have more active dendritic conductances, and then this thing breaks down. And but it's, it's sort of like I would say it's uh, and it's not really clear what this model should look like to begin with. And also, you need to do something else in order to reduce it to level level two. But I think I'll I'll go on to neural networks, and I would say it's not too much is known about neural networks. If I should say one thing, you know quite a bit, a lot of things about single neurons, much less about neural networks. I think one thing we have learned is that, because there was a long time a puzzle that why are, if you look at sort of measurements of spikes in the brain, they're very irregular. Well, typically in the old models, they got very, like, very regular firing patterns. But it turned out, so that I think this is like a really cool idea that came like 10, 15 years ago, that there's actually this, this variability comes from a very sp special kind of balance between excitatory and inhibitory input. So that's sort of like a, a, a more generic question, I would say, which has been answered. Otherwise, I mean, people are now build, starting to build sort of like models for specific, I mean, specific structures. We have done some work on the, on the visual system. <coughs> And I'll just, uh, where you, well, I think I'll, yeah, where, where we can sort of do, make models, essentially of, uh, this is actually a model made by Hillen Tononi, which later was implemented by my colleague, Hans Eckhart Plessit, in Nest, uh, where they essentially take, uh, build models by having like two dimensional sheets covered by these integrated fire neurons in this case, and each of these sheets, which then covers the visual field, uh, I mean, there's like different types of neurons. These are maybe retina and then uh, LGN cells and the visual cortical cells and so on. And then you can do this kind of essentially simulations where you drive, in this case, you drive this sinusoidal stimuli on the retina. This is like a piece of the visual field. And then we drive these, these neurons and you can see that when, when these, these things are on, you can see these stripes here and so on. <coughs> So uh, at least we know how to, I mean, we know how to make models and we also now have tools, which Mark Ola will talk about, which can make it possible to simulate quite large networks. I think the problem now is that we don't really know how to hook them up. We don't really know what parameters to, to specify the networks, but at least we have the tools for, for systematic exploration. So now I'm going to switch gear a little bit and going back to this thing of uh, like imaging. Uh, and, and this point that there is many, many measures of neural activity uh, in the brain. And just to illustrate this point that they don't really measure the same thing. And that has to be taken into account when thinking about it. This is sort of like a, a picture of, the, of mankind or Earth. Uh, this is actually from, from outer space. Say that you were this alien civilization and wanted to figuring out things, learning things about, about the humans. You just, one thing you could do is just measure the electrical activity. So this is actually pictures taken from the space, the space station or from outer space. And from this, you could sort of, it seems like everybody is living in, in Europe and on the eastern part of US and maybe a little bit in Japan and so on. But if you somehow were able to measure the like metabolic, you know, like the food consumption, then you see that actually that most people live there. So it just illustrates that if you want to make two, uh, these are measuring two, two like, different aspects of, of, of human activity. So we have to know when we make models, what do we really measure? And if you allow, I'm not, well, if we now, for example, not focus on the whole, well, on mankind, but to focus on a piece of, of cortex, this is now a set of there's a, a set of different ways to, to measure neural activity. You could even go in electrically with very sharp electrodes and measure like either the membrane potential directly, or if the electrode is just immediately outside, you can measure the spikes, or you can, with this kind of electrode where you have, it's not so sharp, but it has many contact points, you can measure the, well, you can measure more like the, the like spikes from many neurons, or something called the local field potential, which is actually more like the, the population response of how, how a population around the electrode so it processes synaptic inputs. And in addition, you have <coughs> all these uh, uh, light techniques where you send in light and you put in different kinds of markers and so on. And then you, for example, calcium markers so that you get, uh, and then you pick up or you measure the light that comes out of it and interpret that. <coughs> 
So there's <coughs> all kinds of, of different techniques for doing that. And the typical way to, I would say, anal anal analysis these data has sort of to, to measure them separately maybe, and then try to look for correlation. That is very, very confusing. So what I'm at least advocating is that we should try to, we, we should keep in mind that, that actually these different measurements, they, they, it's, it's known, well, at least many of these measurements, it's known uh, how, uh, how what you measure is related to neural activity. For example, if you have a neuron here who's active, if you put a, sh a, a sharp electrode here, you will, the spike you measure will be essentially a weighted sum of the transmembrane currents in the soma region. And we know the link between activity and what you would measure there. While the LFP or the contribution to the EEG, MEG, these distant things, actually corresponds to, it reflects the weighted sum of transmembrane currents all over the neuron. While uh, the voltage sensitive dye, that's another kind of optical measurement technique, reflects this membrane potential in the top. The key thing, if I have a good model for the neuron, I can predict all these things at the same time. So one model can predict all these things. So I think this is sort of kind of multimodal modeling. It's, it's a separate kind of problem. It's more like the measurement physics kind of. It's sort of if you think about CERN, you have the people who think about why you need the Higgs boson. And then you have the people who just think about how to measure it, the detector people, which are like the, most of them actually. So this is more on the detector side than on the information processing side. So we need to work out all these <coughs> mathematical connections between the neuron dynamics and the different experimental modalities. So what you would like, I think, for, if you want to, like a long-term perspective for this, like multi-level, multimodal approach for understanding, say, a cortical column, is that we would like to have, uh, well, three, at least three, models at different levels of detail for the same thing, level one, level two, level three, which should then be interconnected. <coughs> and then you need to develop these links between, uh, well, these models and the things that you can measure. And it turns out that typically if you want to make precise connections between uh, the neural activity and things that you can measure, you need to have this biophysically detailed model. But maybe in order to get the right spiking dynamics in order to understand the information flow and so on, you can get away with this level two or, or level three. So uh, let's see now, we're starting to get a little bit low on, uh, on time. Let's see, I'm just going to see where we are. A lot of questions, which is uh, quite good. Hmm. Okay, I think I'll. Okay, I think I'll just. Oops. Oh, that's. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly talk about this this measurement of electrical potentials in the brain. Because what you typically do then, if you have a piece of cortex and you put down an electrode in the middle of the brain, then you measure a small potential difference if you compare it with an electrode far away. But it's only a few, it's like 10 microvolts or something, not millivolts. So it's really, really small signals. That's why it took a long time to, 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 to actually, I mean, at least, like, it couldn't really be systematically used until maybe like at the, like 80 years ago or something, because only then the amplifiers were good enough to take full advantage of it. <coughs> and then the typical data analysis of this has been that you do a filtering and look at the high frequency part contains information about this. The spikes, low frequency part contains information about the, about the, sub, like the dendritic inputs. But the key thing here is really that <coughs> we know how to model this. If you have, say in this case, if you have a neuron, this orange neuron, if all that happens is that it gets a current in here and it leaves there, <coughs> because that sort of follows from the multi-compartmental multi description. If you know if that's the only thing happens in this part of the brain, then the potential you measure here will be a weighted sum of two contributions. Just one uh, from this current and one from this current. And it, it sort of looks like Coulomb's law, but it's, uh, it's sort of like mathematically the same. 
but it has a different uh, like physical interpretation. But nevertheless, the key thing here is that this can be generalized to, to multi-compartmental models. So if, if we do this multi-compartmental modeling, we can, uh, we can do this, essentially calculate, just keep track of all the transmembrane currents, in addition to, say, the membrane potential and other things you're interested. If you, keep, if you know all the transmembrane currents and where all these compartments are, you can just do this simple sum and then calculate the potential. So this is just illustrates the potential you would see just from following this forward formula. This, the, the population you would see uh, if you had like a one hertz oscillatory input uh, dri driving, well, coming in there, you will get this dipolar antenna of, uh, <coughs> of, uh, in, the, in the potential. And if you do the same thing 100 times faster, you get a very different pattern. And this will reflect, this is actually, uh, and this kind of, yeah, so this, this, from this alone, you would see that actually the 100 hertz component of the things you measure, say, with EEG <coughs> is um, uh, the 100 hertz component of what you measure with EEG is much damped just to the measurement physics, just to like the detector part, detector physics. So one thing that this is important for is that it can be used for mind reading, what we call brain prosthesis. Because these neurons, they set up that is like dipolar and these antennas sending out extracellular potentials or potentials and they can be picked up by these measurement electrodes and then <coughs> used for, for controlling robot arms. So this is, a quite, uh, this is an example from a, a monkey that was trained to, uh, to feed itself, I think it was marshmallows or something. So, so this is, is, you can see that his arm is actually in that tube, so he can't really grab it with his arms. But he has this, electrode on top of his head. So he's taught himself, which then uh, sort of controls his robot arm. So he's able to feed himself by just uh, thinking about it, essentially. So this is, of course, important for, <coughs> for them. I mean, uh, this has now already sort of been, been, been used in also in, in humans <coughs> who are not able to communicate or control their, control their, their limbs. It's actually, it's placed in the motor cortex on top. Yeah, yeah, no. So this is inside the, inside the motor cortex. Hmm. So, um, <coughs> so this, of course, also opens up for this other thing about implants. This is more like mind reading. But implants, meaning that just that you have technology to aid, I mean, it's like input to, input to the brain. That is, I think, at the moment, it's like three three, four hundred thousand people with like cochlear implants uh, in, the, in the world. So this is not something new. And, and now people are also exploring this thing of, of using brain stimulation with electrical currents and magnetic fields. Another way to, to instead of just taking Dave, Dr. Dave's best Einstein to affect your brain, you can actually just uh, use these magnetic coils. And this is illustrated, I just show by this, like a little movie clip showing how this, this could work. Today we're going to show you how the transcranial magnetic stimulator works. So first thing, Yoshi's going to put the magnetic coil over top of the area of my motor cortex that's responsible for the muscles of my hand and forearm. When she's there, she's going to deliver a magnetic pulse. Oh, and you probably saw my arm twitch there. And we can also see this response over here on the oscilloscope because we've measured it using the EMG electrodes over the muscles of my hand and forearm. Now what we're going to do is move that magnetic coil over the span of my motor cortex from one side all the way over to the next. And what you'll see is muscles slowly recruited from my hand up to my elbow, shoulder, right leg. And after she switches hemis hemispheres, we'll see some of the left leg come in and then down the muscles of my left arm. So, here we go. So, right hand, little bit of elbow, some shoulder and leg, 
still right leg. Little response in my left leg there. We've switched hemispheres. More leg on the left side. Left shoulder. Left elbow. And left hand. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> So what, what this illustrates is, of course, that, that with the neurons are electrochemical machines, so we can be affected both by chemistry, taking drugs, but also, also electrically. So I think I'll, I'll just finish off with, I think it's a, a, a movie here, which... Uh, well, maybe. There's, there's another, this is a little bit, I think it was it's another application of this kind of uh, electrical, electrical stimulation of the... Yeah. Can we connect? Oh, this this is this probably yeah. Is probably it. Sorry about this. I should have been. So these are people who are sort of using this technology to to do remote control on cockroaches. Oh, but that's that's wrong. Let's see, Let's see if that's so easy. Hmm. And kids, so people can study neuroscience on their own and learn about their own brains. So this right here is our uh, robo robot. It's like about like six months. And it allows us to study and see how microstimulation works. So this technique is already used for people with deafness in cochlear implants. Cockroaches have these antenna, kind of like this. When they walk around and touch things, they'll want to turn the other way. So we're essentially telling it that it's touching something by simulating its antenna with a signal similar to what they use in Parkinson's. When I swipe to the right, I simulate this right antenna and then feel the right. There you go, we have it. It's a cyborg. We're using a computer interface to actually innervate the nerves of the antenna of the cyborg and move around. The neurons they have here are very similar to human ones. So we can actually learn a little bit about our own brains by playing with the uh, Okay. Okay. So I'll just uh, end with this list of uh, of, of books, uh, which I sort of collected about where I think is sort of like we can learn more about computational neuroscience. Actually, my favorite is the one where David will show the organizer is. Uh, it's not only because he's the, the leader of the training committee. But it's actually it's a nice, uh, that's what I use in my course now, principles of, of computational modeling in, in neuroscience. But there are several good books out there for those who you want to study more. Okay, so I think that's a good place to, to, st to stop. <laughs>